Okay, I think I'll start right up. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series presented by American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society in partnership with WBUR City Space. I'm Margaret Talkett, producer of literary programs at NEHGS. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking particularly at women in the last century and the opportunities afforded them by sea travel. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event featuring author Sean Evans and her most recently published work, Maiden Voyages, Magnificent Ocean Liners and the Women Who Traveled and Worked Aboard Them. Following a brief illustrated presentation, Sean will be in dialogue with Robin Young, host of the radio program Here and Now from WBUR and NPR. I'll share their full bios in a moment, but for now, some housekeeping items. We are in a Zoom webinar format, which means your microphone is muted and your video is off. While we cannot take your comments in the chat box, we will share relevant links there, so do keep an eye out. We do want to hear from you, though. We asked for your questions as you registered, and we got many great questions. If you have additional questions, please enter them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Again, the Q&A, and we'll try to slip in a few more. Tonight's program is being recorded by my colleagues here at the Brew Family Learning Center at American Ancestors. The video will be published in the days ahead on the American Inspiration website, as well as on our education pages. Excerpts will also run on the WBUR program here and now it, within the next couple days. We'll share all those links in the chat and we're going to Zoom email it to you too as soon as it's ready. Copies of tonight's book, this afternoon's book actually, um, are purchasable through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. You'll see on the screen the coupon code AMINSP20, which is also being placed in the chat. Do write that down. If you use the code as you order, the shipping fee for media mail will be waived. This is an August special. Even better, the book you receive will be signed by the author on a book plate. Many of you have said that your female relatives traveled by sea last century. Century. This book is for them, rich with stories, humble and grand. It's also for lovers of cultural and women's history. Now, some background on our featured guests this afternoon. Our featured author, Sean Evans, is the author of several works, including Queen Bees, Six Brilliant and Extraordinary Society Hostesses Between the Wars. Based in London, she is involved in numerous projects in all forms of media. Most notably, she's a freelance film consultant for the National Trust, and her articles have appeared in The Daily Mail, The Daily Express, The Lady, and BBC Roadshow Magazine, as well as in National Trust publications. On to our special moderator this evening. For over 20 years, Robin Young has been the host of Here and Now, the W the WBUR and NPR radio program. She is a Peabody award-winning documentary filmmaker and has reported for NBC, CBS, and ABC. Robin has received several Emmy Awards in addition to radio's regional Edward R. Murrow Award. She's gonna join us briefly for a discussion with Sean, but for now, Sean, welcome. We are so glad that you're here with us this afternoon. And I just have to ask, tell us where, where are you Zooming in from this afternoon or actually this evening? Uh, in my case, it's this evening because appropriately enough, I'm doing this transatlantically. I'm actually at my family's house in Cardiff, which is the capital of Wales. So I'm in the United Kingdom at the moment. It's a dark, grey, miserable evening, the sort, of, the sort of evening that the Wales Tourist Board tries to keep under wraps. Oh, well, I can't say the Boston Chamber of Commerce has an easier uh, duty today because it's a rainy, awful day here in Boston. And we are so grateful for you joining us in an evening program. Um, this is our first ever midday American Inspiration author event, but it will surely be worth it. And Sean, we do love so many things about your new book. Of course, the family history part and that it's all about women who are so often underrepresented in history and also in genealogy, women are, are quite hard to track. 
uh, in genealogy and we're making a good go of it at my organization and we really thank you for your research. Uh, we also thank you, I do know the book is being published officially next week, so thank you for letting us get a jump on it. I know you've got some fabulous reviews coming and congratulations. If you are ready to take us out on the high seas, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. What a lovely introduction, and uh, welcome aboard, everybody. Is all I can say. Um, we'll be uh, we'll be having a quick run through, if you like, the, um, the 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 salient points I feel of 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 what you'll find in maiden voyages. It was an absolute delight to research, but a bit of a beast to um, to wrangle, as you might imagine, to write. Um, Courtney, if you could possibly let us have the first slide, we'll see what we've got on screen, and I'll start talking to you from these images. We've got about 14 slides. And I'll just run through some of the interesting things that I thought were worth looking at. Uh, there's Q&As afterwards, of course. I'd be delighted to take your questions. I may not have the answers, but I'll do my best. Um, this is a poster from 1914. Uh, it was produced by the Cunard Line. Cunard was Britain's primary um, ocean liner company, although it was originally set up by Samuel Cunard, who was from Halifax in Nova Scotia in the 1840s. This ship is the Aquitania. In 1914, it was launched in May um, to sail, the, uh, sail between Britain and America, taking people traveling for business, for pleasure, for leisure, emigres, cargo, the works. It was the biggest ocean liner in the world at that point. What I like about this advertising poster is the way in which, as you can see, it layers, it shows the geological strata, if you like, the hierarchy of society at that time. So the top two decks are given over to those who could afford them. They have roomy, they're airy, people have gorgeous interiors. Below them there's the second class um, who are perfectly respectable people, usually quite well healed, traveling in smaller cabins. And then symbolically just above the waterline, just above the cargo, you've got the third class. These are the people who were not so well off, they were emigres, they were traveling for work, they might be performers. These were the people who all together made a slice through the entire ship. Um, and they, between them, the ship itself was like a microcosm. It would be afloat for five or six days. It would be run by the captain and the crew. And once the ship was out of sight of land, the ship had to be self-reliant and all the people on it also had to be self-reliant. Now, the women who traveled on these ships, they needed female crew, female staff to be seemly, to help them um, deal with things like uh, personal hygiene, uh, to deal with small children, to deal with um, the, the, the ramifications of ocean travel in those days, which could involve a great deal of seasickness. So um, there were women who were employed on these ships for the first time in the early part of the 20th century, and I became fascinated in researching them. If we go to the next slide, I'll show you how this came about. This is my great great uncle. He's my grandfather's uncle, Captain Stephen Grono. I come from a long line of seafarers, uh, the Gronos and the Robertses. Uh, one of my ancestors was actually a pirate called Black Bart Roberts, uh, who plundered the Spanish main in the 18th century. But uh, Captain Stephen Grono was much more respectable. He was a uh, chief officer on the Aquitania. He started serving on there in 1914 and he left in 1930. He plied the, the Atlantic route between um, uh, Southampton uh, and or Liverpool and New York and Boston. Um, Captain Groner was a bit of a hero because in 1917, he volunteered to take a cargo ship, the Vinovia, back from New York, laden with armaments and brass and, and, and munitions. And his ship was torpedoed by a German U-boat in, um, in the British Channel, uh, the English Channel. Uh, it was a December night and eight of his crew were killed instantly by the torpedo and the ship very gradually sank underneath him as Captain Grono attempted to steer it into land. Um, and he literally stepped out into the water, praying in Welsh that he would be saved. Uh, and he was found floating the next morning, clinging to some of the wreckage, attached to which fortunately was the ship's bell. They dragged him in, they dried him out and they put him back on the Aquitania. So Stephen Grono, um, members of my family still remember him, he died in 1942. And it was in researching his life but I started looking at the Aquitania, his ship, and realized that there were women who not only traveled on these ships, but also worked on them. If we could have the next slide, please. This is the remarkable Violet Jessup, known as the unsinkable stewardess. Uh, she was born in 1888 in, uh, of Irish parents in, um, in Argentina. Um, she became a stewardess 
purely because her family could not survive without one of them going to work at sea. Uh, with her wages and her tips, she managed to, to care for her elderly mother and her four or five siblings who had no other form of support. Being a stewardess was actually a very good way of making a living in the early, uh, early part of the 20th century. And Violet amazingly spent 43 years working at sea. She finally gave up in her 60s. Uh, she died in the 1970s in Britain. Uh, she was known as the unsinkable stewardess because she was on a ship, the Olympic, which hit, struck another ship, she survived that. She survived the sinking of the Titanic. She was given a baby to hold and put into a lifeboat uh, in order to show the other people who were panicking and planning to leave the ship how to get into a lifeboat. She survived that. And then she survived in 1917, a torpedo attack on the Britannic, a nursing ship on which, as you can see, she was a nurse. A remarkable woman, her life is well worth celebrating. And she's just one of the many women who I write about at great length, it should be said, in Maiden Voyages. I do love Violet, I think she's an amazing character. Um, and she had a great sense of humor and her memoirs are worth tracking down and reading. Now, in the wake of the Titanic, obviously Violet survived it, but 1700 people didn't. In the wake of the sinking of the Titanic, there was a great deal of agonizing on the part of would-be travelers. We forget that up until the 1950s, if you wanted to go from one continent to another, from the North American continent to Europe or backwards or forwards, you had to do it by ship. Until the advent of planes, um, there was no choice. It didn't matter how seasick you were, how scared you were, how nervous you were, how much you hated storms. If you wanted to travel between the two continents, it had to be by ship. So the shipping companies in the wake of the Titanic disaster, which was 1912, looked into ways to reassure the traveling public, particularly women. If we could have the next slide, please. This is the deck of the Aquitania, my favorite ship, as you can probably tell. Here are lots of nice ladies having tea in the afternoon. It's very a bit breezy, but they suck it out. But note on the deck above them, lots of very visible lifeboats, plenty of lifeboat provision. And interestingly, the curved arms, which support the lifeboats, they swim, swing backwards and forwards like that. They are held up by a thing called a davit, and the improved davits, which were um, attached to new ships in order to make sure that lifeboat launching was safe, were designed by my great great uncle, Captain Stephen Groner, who took out a patent uh, for this new design of davits to make launching lifeboats about uh, in October 1912, so just months after the sinking of the Titanic, and as a direct result as of the sinking of the Titanic. So you can see they're, they're promoting this ship as being a little bit like being in the Ritz, but with lots more fresh air and ozone and breezes. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. In the 1920s, the only way to travel, as I say, was by what they called the Atlantic Ferry. And there were many people who traveled very regularly. Um, Fred uh, and Adele Astaire, they were sisters, uh, sister and brother, and they were a song and dance act. Um, and they became immensely popular uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and they treated these great big ships as what they call the Atlantic Ferry. They're constantly moving between the two continents for work. Um, Fred Astaire, of course, went on to be in movies. Adele Astaire um, actually married into the British aristocracy. But they were always game for a, a song and dance. They're extremely popular. One of the nice things about traveling by ship in this era was if you paid enough and you traveled in first class, you would have proximity to celebrity. In other words, there will be people, stars, millionaires, maharajas, um, celebrities of one sort or another, with whom you might be traveling. It might be the Prince of Wales, it might be Marlene Dietrich, it might be the Aga Khan, it might be any film star you can think of, Charlie Chaplin, for example. And people loved traveling uh, anywhere near where they could see um, stars of any sort. Now, the stars, needless to say, um, went along with this and posed for photographs. Uh, it's part of the quid pro quo. If we could go to the next slide, please. This is the Queen Mary, it launched in 1936, um, a British ship. As you can see, it was quintessential Art Deco. Um, all these ships did their utmost to, to give off a sense of luxury and panache and to be at the cutting edge of design by the 1930s. Interestingly, in the 1910s, when they were launched, um, ships like the Aquitania focused on having historic style, uh, style interiors. The idea being it would reassure 
um, sort of slightly worried ladies that if they were traveling in what looked like a Robert Adam library, despite what they could see out of the porthole of the ocean doing this, nevertheless, they would feel reassured that it was like traveling in a country house. But by the 1920s and 30s, the whole stylistic thing had changed around and it was considered to be absolutely quintessentially fascinating to go on board a ship which was cutting edge in terms of design and architecture. Uh, this ship, 1936, um, was the launch of the Queen Mary. Um, uh, a 14 year old called Heather Beagley, um, a British girl, traveled on it and she wrote it up and said it was absolutely, it was like going to the moon. So you can't imagine how advanced and progressive and exciting it was. Now, Heather Beagley is 99 years old and is still with us. And quite amazingly, she recently gave a little talk about the launch of the, um, uh, the Queen Mary to her fellow um, senior home um, inhabitants. Uh, and I'm writing about Heather Beagley for the Daily Beast for next week. So um, I'm very fond of Heather. I think she's an amazing character. So in 1936, we have this fantastic ship being launched. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to look at how people spent their time while on these ships. These ships still took five or six days, even the fastest ship took five or six days to travel between Europe and North America. There was a, an informal competition for a thing called the Blue Riband, which was the fastest ship, and it was never ending formal, but the ships of different nations competed to be the quickest. Would it be the Germans in the Bremen and the, or the Europa? Would it be the French in the Normandy? They constantly uh, attempted to get as far and as fast as they could, but it was always at least five days. And the way in which you spent your time it was like an enforced holiday. If we go to the next slide, please. You would spend your evenings probably dancing. You would spend your evenings um, having, you know, wearing the most immaculate fashions you could find uh, and cutting a dash. It was very much an opportunity for, um, for people to dress up and, and as they do now on cruise ships, this is really the genesis of the idea of cruising for, for fun, you know, um, and dancing to a band, dancing to, uh, to records as, as time went on. Um, it was a nice thing to do. What they didn't tell you in the advertising was that ships such as the Queen Mary often rolled and pitched. A ship such as the Queen Mary was an eighth of a mile long and when the sea was rough it would go up a wave and crash down the other side so it was a little bit like traveling on a seesaw um, they tended to keep that kind of information quiet but nevertheless the idea was to cut a dash and to look smart and one of the best ways of doing this was to take advantage of what was known as la grande descente the great descent now this is something instigated by uh, emily grigsby who is an american um, uh, heiress uh, she was extremely fashionable and she was constantly hopping across the the atlantic uh, buying her clothes from vionnet and worth and paul poiret and so forth and she was tiny and petite and beautiful and she took advantage of the beautiful spiral staircases that went down into the main dining rooms in first class um, to make a grand entrance. Um, and this became the fashion for women. There'd be lalique glass and mirrors and you'd swanny down on the arm of your, your lovely gentleman wearing a dinner jacket. He'd be in the dinner jacket. You'd be wearing the world's most wonderful evening dress and all your diamonds. And as we shall see from the next slide, um, there are women whose career was based on making uh, an impact like that. This is Hedy Lamarr, um, the uh, wonderful um, uh, 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 Hollywood star. She's also quite an inventor, uh, and I'd recommend thoroughly you read the book to see that, that, Holly, uh, that Hedy Lamarr was the um, progenitor of um, the um, wireless uh, signals which we now rely on for doing this kind of event, okay? She was absolutely amazing as a woman. She started off as an actor in, um, an actress in Vienna. Uh, she made an early and ill-advised marriage to an armaments manufacturer called Fritz Mandel. Uh, he was very right-wing and he was very keen to court um, the Nazis, um, uh, Hitler in particular, um, and to sell him armaments. And Hedy ran away from her unhappy marriage. She managed to get to Paris. She managed to get to London. She had very little money, but she, um, she managed to get an interview with Louis B. Mayer, who was happened to be in London at the time looking for European acting talent. And she tried to persuade him to take her on. And he, he offered her a very small contract and wasn't all that convinced. And she turned him down. But she found out from his secretary that Louis B. Mayer was booked onto the Normandy, the French ship, going back to America. And so she staked the last money she had, she had very little cash. She staked that on buying a cheap ticket, a one-way ticket to the States on the Normandy. 
and she had the most beautiful clothes, but she had no money. Um, this was the last throw of the dice for her. And every night she would do the La Grande Descent down into the ballroom wearing yet another fantastic outfit, a wonderful jewellery uh, on the arm of some beautiful bow. She'd sweep past Mr. Mayor and say, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, how lovely to see you. And just keep going. And by the end of the, um, the six day voyage, Louis B. Mayer had relented and he'd signed her up for a very lucrative Hollywood contract. So the runaway, um, the transatlantic runaway, this was the making of her. It was a gamble. It was a throw of the dice and it changed her entire life. And subsequently she went on to change everybody else's lives um, because of what she invented. But as I say, the story is too complicated. So I, I would strongly advise you read the book on that one. Now, if we could go to the next slide, please. One of Hedy's contemporaries, Marlena Dietrich. What a woman. Um, I've never known anyone dressed so well, so smartly. She was absolutely remarkable. Uh, Marlene Dietrich was one of those Hollywood stars, uh, originally from Germany, obviously, um, was one of those Hollywood stars who recognized the importance of personal appearances. And she traveled extensively between Europe and America on these great ships. Uh, she had a motto, always be seen. It was actually um, told to her by her great friend, Noel Coward. His view was that you should always make sure to be seen by your paying public, uh, pose for cameras, um, be affable, be pleasant. Uh, and her view was always be seen, but only after lunch. She would have the mornings to herself and, uh, herself, and you can quite understand why. Um, to be uh, a star on these ships was actually a very interesting existence because five or six days you'd be traveling and sensible stars realized that the onboard photographers, uh, for, as I say, as a quid pro quo, if they pose the photographs, the onboard photographers would take great photos, which they would then release on behalf of Cunard or French Line or whoever uh, owned the shipping company to the press. The press would then get fantastic photographs of people like Marlene Dietrich, in which they which had been put in their newspapers. Marlene Dietrich would get the coverage and she'd get preferential treatment. So there were many stars who traded um, an affable appearance, a photo call, uh, for better treatment or a free trip or whatever. Uh, and this sort of symbiosis between um, the celebrities of the day, the, the, uh, the, the very fashionable means of traveling in ships such as these, these great ships, and also the relationship with Hollywood is another area I explore in this book, because if you look at movies from the 1930s, there are some wonderful ones set on board ship. So there are, um, uh, um, movies starring Fred Astaire and so forth, Betty Davis, uh, now Voyager. There are lots of movies where the ship is the actual um, star of the show, or it's the setting of the show. Um, a top hat, I think, there's a, there's a whole uh, sequence set on, on, on board a liner. So as I say, there's this kind of symbiosis between the ships, which are very um, progressive looking, and the, um, and the stars and the idea of glitz and glamour and travel. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. One lady who did travel extensively on these ships uh, was Lady Astor. Um, she's very, very famous in Britain. I'm not quite so sure how well known she is in America. Uh, she was American born. She was a, a Virginian heiress, uh, Virginia born heiress. And she married Waldorf Astor, who was also American, of course. Uh, and she became the first ever female member of parliament in the British parliament in 1919. Um, and she was a remarkable character, but she was also a staunch, what you might call an uh, Atlanticist. Uh, Margaret and I were chatting about this word yesterday. Uh, an Atlanticist is somebody who relished the, the special relationship between America and, uh, and particularly Britain, but also Europe, uh, and wanted to nurture that and wanted to foster it and engender it. Um, and here Lady Astor is surrounded by what were known as the gangplank willies. Uh, these were the almost rapacious, I think it has to be said, um, newsmen, cameramen, uh, reporters and so forth, who would uh, lurk in New York in the harbour, waiting for the next big ship to come in, and they'd belt out to the ship in a tender as soon as it was seen and come on board, and they would uh, nab um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the celebrities of the day and do interviews with them. And again, this was, it was a great source of news, great source of copy for the American papers and the British ones, don't get me wrong, it's a two-way process. Um, and also it was extremely um, useful for people like Lady Astor who wanted to promote their views. Now, there's a huge more I could tell you about all this, but I'm going to cut now to the GI Brides and Their Babies, which is going to be our last image, just because I think that does 
show, um, if you like, the nature of the special relationship or maybe that special relationships, because so many um, soldiers from an airman uh, and naval um, employees from, um, from America came to Britain during World War II and were stationed here prior to the D-Day landings and proximity and curiosity and human nature being what it was, uh, they met and married many British women. Um, and uh, in 1946, these great ships were once again pressed into service, having spent the wartime ferrying troops backwards and forwards. Um, they, they, they were pressed once more into service to take back these, uh, these mostly young women, and they're often very young children, sometimes they were just pregnant, um, in somewhat trying conditions. Britain had survived six years of war, um, rationing had been intense. To these women, it was a mixed blessing traveling on these ships, and it was a leap in the dark, as indeed traveling transatlantic always was in those days. If you left your home country, you might not see those people that you loved ever again, but you had to do it hopefully, you'd go hopefully, you'd travel hopefully, you'd hope to arrive, you'd hope to make a new life on the other side of the, um, of the globe. And one of these women described herself famously as heartsick, lovesick and seasick, which is really rather sweet. So that's my last slide. I'm going to hand back now to, um, to Robin, I think it is, and, and Margaret, and we'll take it from there. I'm very keen to know if anyone's got any Q&As. Well, Sean, we have so many questions coming in already, um, coming in before the event even started. So yes. we are going to get to those. And I, I just want to, for a second here, say thank you to Margaret and to American Ancestors, a group about which I want to know a lot more. Uh, this has been just incredible to, to know as much as I do now about it. And Sean, this book, as I said to you when we first chatted yesterday, I don't know how we're going to do this because there's just so much detail in here. It's it's just incredible. I want to add to the names you've mentioned. There was Hilda James, the uh, the young Olympic swimming champion who fled a, an abusive home in Liverpool to be a swim coach on a Cunard ship. Uh, Martha Gellhorn, the war correspondent who, as you wrote, survived a marriage to Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> She stowed away aboard a cruise ship that had become a hospital ship uh, during the war, wearing a nurse's uniform that she found at, to get to the front and cover D-Day at Normandy. You referenced the luxury liner aspect and uh, some of the names there. There was also Thelma Furness, the yes. banking heiress, longtime mistress of the Prince of Wales, until she introduced him to her friend, Wallace Simpson. Oops. Um, and Thelma <laughs> often traveled on the ships with her twin sister, Gloria Vanderbilt. I mean, That's these right. names are, are just, they resonate with us, but then there are the names we might never have heard of if not for you. And these are the people in steerage, third class, immigrants, lots of women and children uh, in terrible conditions, especially early on. Um, I wanna start there because you mentioned stewardesses and these were the women who often, they left their families at home uh, in places like Liverpool. And they got these jobs that uh, not only helped them support the families, but gave them a sense of sophistication and a worldliness that they might not have had, but they were treating, tending to and serving the people in upper class. You also tell us about the conductresses. They mm. cared for the women below, um, including the unfortunately named Edith Sourbutts. Now, it can, can we just start there below? Because here are just a couple of the questions. And I'm going to sprinkle your questions throughout because we've got so many. But people are asking, speak about the women who traveled to America to be domestic workers in the early 1900s, the conditions in steerage. How long was the trip from Ireland to New York? My grandmother came in 1903, my grandfather 1904. My ancestors, another person writes, came in 1901 on the Campania. What was that voyage like? So talk about the women who were the conductresses and the women that were down below. Okay, the women who are conductresses, they're employed specifically to look after unaccompanied women and children uh, throughout the ship, but especially in third class. Uh, they were brought in um, in order, there was a great concern immediately after World War I um, about uh, what was known as the white slave trade. And we laugh about it now and think, well, that sounds very, you know, um, very sort of uh, histrionic. But in fact, it was sex trafficking. It did exist, it's always existed. And there were women in particular and, and young girls and boys uh, 
um, who were put on these ships um, from Europe. Um, they didn't speak any of the languages, they were traveling alone, and they were prey to being picked off by unsavory characters, uh, either on the ships or indeed when they got to the ports um, in, in, in North America. It happened in South America, it happened all over the place. So these conductresses were employed specifically to look after the moral as well as the physical welfare of uh, people in their, women and children in particular, in their control. And Edith Sauerbutz, as you say, um, a, a, a shocking name, um, but a, <laughs> a terrific character whose unpublished memoir is in the Imperial War Museum in London. I turned it up. She was, she started off as a typist. She hated typing. She was a stenographer who did not want to be a stenographer. So she went to work on the ships. Um, and her account of her life is absolutely gripping. Um, she, uh, she sailed frequently between um, Belgium, Antwerp, uh, Ireland and New York and then Boston so she did sort of five point journey um, with people who were basically um, emigrating uh, taking their lives in their hands and emigrating to to northern North America she loved her job she was a, a doughty person who who protected um, the, the girls and the and the and the uh, and the boys in her care um, she was made redundant sadly in, 19, in the 1930s because of the um, the, the Great Depression uh, and then she got another job as a stewardess on the Queen Mary in 1936. So her life changed completely rather than dealing with people who were um, uh, scared uh, with whom she had very little in common in language, for whom she had a great deal of sympathy down in the third class. Uh, she became a first class stewardess uh, where she was dealing with, with lots of people who were much more wealthy and sophisticated. But her heart was always looking at the welfare of, um, uh, of less well-off people. And during World War II, she had a land-based job, uh, which I write about in this book, where um, her, her concern for a fellow human being comes through, really shines. Oh, I'm, I'm going to jump in and say she was one of the people who helped evacuate children she from did. the war-torn area, including one group of children that were on a, 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 one of these cruise ships that had been repurposed. It's re, these ships are repurposed throughout war times to be yes. hostage to the ferry troops or evacuate children. And one that she'd helped children get on was attacked and many of those children died. So she, did. Uh, well, she had quite a life. But you described one of the immigrants that was there in third class. Her name was Mary. She was the youngest of 10 in a family in, uh, in Scotland, a town that lost most of its young men. Mm. When a ship returning them from war was attacked, uh, sank. So she traveled uh, to New York, met a guy named Fred Trump, <laughs> and also became the mother of Donald Trump. Mary was one of the immigrants. She was. Mary Ann McLeod was an economic migrant. Uh, she was born in 1912 on the island of Lewis in, in remote bits of Scotland. As you say, Robin, um, there had been a terrible accident uh, on New Year's Eve 1918. Uh, a whole load of men from the, from the islands were being returned on board a ship um, and there was a storm. Uh, they'd been returned to their homelands and um, hundreds of them died when the ship was wrecked on the out, just on the outskirts of the harbour. Uh, and Mary, uh, Mary Ann McLeod would have been, let me think, she would have been six years old. And she would have been very aware of the dearth of men and the, the pall of sadness that hung over the island. Uh, she had a, a couple of older sisters who had gone into service in New York. One of them had gone to New York first because she, she'd had a child out of wedlock, uh, which was a great scandal in those days. And the only way in which she could be seen to get over this was for the rest of the family to bring up the child uh, while she went to America to seek her fortune. And there she met a, an English born butler. And she provided, if you like, a stepping stone for successive sisters to go out there. So Mary Ann McLeod. Um, managed to scrape together enough money in 1930 to set out for New York. Um, she was 17 when she got on the boat in Glasgow and she was 18 when she got off it. She was tall, she was blonde, she was pretty and she had quite a, you know, quite a dynamic attitude. She put herself down as a domestic servant, as most women did, because if you didn't put down domestic servant as your employ, uh, your form of employment, they might not let you in. There was a shortage of domestic servants in the US and Canada in the 20s and 30s. So any woman claiming that she was a domestic servant, even if she didn't really want to work as a domestic servant, was usually ushered in. Yeah. So Mary Ann McLeod landed in New York, went to live with her sister and was introduced to Fred Trump, uh, aspiring property magnate um, at a party and uh, reader, she married him. And the result, as we know, her fourth child was Donald J. Trump. You have mentioned uh, tragedies, um, and you describe them in such detail, uh, sinkings, not just the Titanic, but the mm. Britannic, which had been commissioned as a hospital ship during uh, World War I, yes. and was torpedoed, 
and as it sank, as you describe it, um, the you know the almost 400 nurses on board calmly get into lifeboats, only to watch as the ship in the front lists up. The front of the boat starts to no lifts down underwater, which raises the back of the boat with these giant propellers, which immediately starts slicing the mm -hmm. lifeboats and the people on board. I mean, the details you have, we mentioned the other shipload of children during World War II that was bombed. You give us so many reminders. There were many tragedies at sea. There were, it was a very dangerous place to work. Um, uh, obviously in, in, in the case of uh, dear um, um, Violet Jessup, the unsinkable stewardess, she was one of the ones in the lifeboat or who, who left the, Titan, uh, the uh, Britannic uh, and the ship was still moving forward, as you say, the back end of the ship was, was going upwards and so the propellers were churning and she watched in horror as successive little boats were drawn into the wake and just chopped up. Uh, more than 30 people died uh, in minutes, seconds really, uh, and she dived out of her boat just in time, uh, went underneath the, the, um, the boat, uh, had a head injury but was pulled to safety. Um, she lost large chunk of hair actually from her scalp and had to wear a wig for the rest of her life but the, it was a very dangerous place to work um you know if, if you think about it if you fell off a cruise ship now even if you could swim what would you do you know the ship moves off you're left aren't you in the middle of the ocean there's there's not a great deal you can do unless you've been spotted yeah. so um some of these women I, I write about actually uh took matters into their own hands they were female staff on board ships they were stewardesses or cooks or cashiers or whatever and they did their lifeboat um skills so they knew how to manage a lifeboat uh how to make the men row how to launch it with the, with the davits going down and all the rest of it um so a lot of these women were really quite punchy um feisty women in the 20s and 30s who thought well i'm not going to be some poor little sap i'm going to learn how to steer and row a lifeboat so if i end up in that situation i've got some control over my own destiny the, it, it does seem as if the parallel stories of both the women who were getting jobs on board these ships and the women who were down in steerage uh, you know with huddling with their children often very nauseous both of them were being given opportunity through a cruise yes. ship. How did you do your incredible research? The detail's incredible. Here are some questions coming in. My ancestors immigrated from Germany and Sweden in 1886, probably by Castle Island in New mm, York. Yeah. I can't find entry records or ship logs. Somebody else writes, are there any archives for the American line? My grandfather, great aunt, and her husband were employed in the early 20th century as first mate, hostess, and captain mostly on SS St. Louis. I want to find out more about them. Someone else writes, my mom sailed to and from Europe in the 50s. Where can one begin trying to research info about specific voyages? Okay, well, this is where Google is your friend. Obviously, I wrote mostly from British and Irish sources because that was what was available to me. Uh, I went to the fantastic Cunard archives, which are in uh, the University of Liverpool here in, here in Britain, um, where they've kept everything to do with Cunard. Uh, but I also use the Imperial War Museum archives, uh, British Library, that sort of thing. Now, fantastic archives exist in the States. I know there is a museum of um, uh, about ocean liners in New York, which I sadly, because of the pandemic, have yet to visit, but I'd love to. Um, there is a, a lot of information out there. You literally start by Googling. You can just start by Googling if you've got the name of a ship, if you know the name of your ancestors. There are records as to who entered which country when and on what ship. It does take a bit of legwork, but it can be done. And I'd recommend thoroughly that people start looking into, um, start with your own local uh, history society or genealogy society, but look also at, at records um, of, uh, of entry points into America. Obviously Ellis Island is one of them, um, but I would start by looking at the, uh, the, the museum in New York and take it from there. Well, I was also thinking that, again, the unfortunately named Edith Sauerbutz, who, who shepherded all these women in steerage, um, yes. many of them, she took copious notes. And as I was reading, as you yes. quoted them, I'm thinking, that's going to be someone's grandmother. Oh, you know, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's such a thrill when you see someone's name, you know, uh, I mean, if you if you go to the, the uh, archives of various shipping companies, so for example, Cunard, they've got passenger lists, you can look them up online. Um, and they only tend to keep the passenger names from the first and second class, which is interesting because third class, we're usually only going one way and they usually weren't paying a great deal of money. But it isn't impossible to find records of people who traveled in third class. And again, Ellis Island and immigration records in New York are where you want to be looking. If like me, if your family were nothing very grand. I mean, I had a, a great, great uncle, a relative of um, 
of Stephen Gronu, um, and he was called Harry Roberts, and he uh, emigrated from, he was a, he was a merchant seaman in, uh, on British liners, and he ended up living in America in the late 1890s, and he was something to do with the Staten Island Ferry. Now, mm. I'd love to research that, I just haven't had time so far, but you know, Harry Roberts, New York, Staten Island Ferry, is it the sort of thing you can, you can start by looking at... Um, Newspapers, because I also go to newspapers a lot. We had a very interesting question, Robin. One person I noticed um, asked, did I look at the onboard newspapers produced on board these ships? Yes, I did. They were fascinating. How do you and get I've written them? a lot about it in this book. Of the Where, 1940s. Do you get them? Where do you get well, them? Well, um, I found one, uh, I found a load of them in, a, in the British Library, but I mean, libraries will have them. They were newspapers which were produced every day on board each ship. They had a printing press on board. Um, the, uh, the Marconi men, uh, they were the people who ran the wireless telegraph system. Um, they would uh, be sent news headlines from, um, from, from, you know, from the mainland, uh, whether from America or from Europe, uh, halfway out in the ocean. They transcribed these and they'd give them to the guys who were doing the, 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 the uh, setting up the type for the, for the paper. And every day there would be a nice news story. Uh, there will be a nice and interesting piece about um, the, the, the marriage plans of the Prince of Wales in 1914, the onboard newspaper for the Aquitania in the middle of June and um, July talks about where um, Queen Mary is planning to spend her, this is Queen Mary of England, is planning to spend her summer holidays with her German relatives and how the Prince of Wales is thinking of marrying one of the, one of the Tsar's daughters. And of course, all this suddenly comes to a halt there's a little news in brief a nib in the same newspaper which says that the body of france ferdinand who was the heir to the austrian throne uh, who'd been assassinated his body has been taken back to trieste uh, for burial following his assassination and that's the first inkling you get of world war one and of course the plans of the Tsar's family, the plans of the Prince of Wales, Queen Mary's plans, where she's going to spend her summer holidays, the summer of 1914, shot down in flames. These are fascinating insights into what people were interested in on that day, on that voyage. Well, and as we said, the plans of Gloria Vanderbilt's sister yes. <laughs> went awry when she introduced that same Prince of Wales to her friend, um, Wallace Simpson. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody we, has another question, which I want to get to the, obviously people had relatives, had ancestors on these ships, because someone is asking, would the servants or nannies that cared for the small children of first class passengers, would those nannies travel in first class with their employers or down a class in second or steerage? Would it depend on the inclination of the employer? My focus of interest, <laughs> this is like I'm asking for a friend, my focus <laughs> of interest is 1900 to 1909. OK, that's a very interesting era. Um, yes, uh, nannies were very much in demand. A, a nanny was a very, very important pass, uh, person in any well-to-do household because the nanny had full care of the child. It might even be several nannies. It might be an under nanny as well as a, a, a senior nanny. Um, uh, they had care of the child of a well-off family um, virtually 24-7. So, yes, you would get these uh, when we looked at the, the Aquitania and I, I pointed out the, the the, the top cabins, those top cabins were usually suites and they had servants rooms attached rather as you'd get a posh suite now in a in a, a very grand hotel you'd have little rooms for the the retinue the rest of the people the entourage you know your your posse would travel with I you. I wouldn't know but I'll, I'll <laughs> I've heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Your posse would travel with you, and nanny, I mean, well-to-do parents would, would you know, uh, they produce the child, they produce an heir, a spare, and a couple more spares if they can, uh, in well-off uh, marriages, but uh, once the, the children uh, arrive, they are handed to nanny, and the next time you see them might be for an hour every day before supper. Um, and they're beautifully turned out. But no, they would be completely in the care of nannies. Now, the Cunards uh, uh, and, and White Star Lines of this world realise the importance of nannies to all classes, and they, they introduced creches for people who weren't so well off, couldn't afford their own nannies, but, but who would leave their charges, leave their kids with the, the you know the, the crash the onboard crash for the rest of the uh, most of the voyage actually it must have been an awful job I don't think I'd be very good at it <laughs> um by the way we're hearing from someone from American ancestors that uh, people who are listening uh, want to research try contacting the steamship historical society of America yeah that's a really good idea yeah they're brilliant 
Yep. Mm -hmm. .shsa.org. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, let's talk specifically about some of the ships because we're getting questions. Lusitania. Oh, uh, the Lusitania. It, yeah. It sank. Remind us how that, that horrible event happened. And this person is asking, were there any celebrities on board that ship? Yeah, I think there were a, lot, a number of celebrities on board that ship. Um, it actually sank in, I think it was May, certainly 1915. It was a British ship, one of the Cunard Lines um, ships. Uh, all the Cunard ships ended in IA. Uh, the names ended in IA, so the Lusitania, obviously, um, Campania, um, uh, Aquitania. Uh, they're all named after Roman provinces for, for various reasons. Um, the Lusitania uh, was um, a beautiful ship, absolutely gorgeous. and um, in 1914, when World War I started, the Cunard ships were um, uh, co-opted, if you like, by the British government uh, into being armed merchant cruisers, AMCs. In other words, they were fitted with guns, a lot of them, so that if need be, they could, uh, they could retaliate if they were set upon by German U-boats, um, submarines. Um, now, the Lusitania, even though it had these fixings on it, uh, was still considered to be a passenger ship. Um, and it was assumed that the, uh, the fact it was carrying people from a neutral nation, particularly America, uh, coming back from New York to, to, um, to Britain, uh, meant that it would be safe from enemy action. However, on the morning that it set out from New York, the German embassy in New York put a notice in the press saying, we regard ships of foreign powers as being enemies, and therefore we withhold the right to uh, fire upon them if we see them. The Lusitania, it was a very sad story. It could get, travel very fast. It could travel far faster uh, than a U-boat. It could outrun it, but there was a shortage of coal and a shortage of manpower. And so the ship was going slower than it needed to as it went off the coast of Ireland. It came into the sights of a German submarine, a U-boat, and it was torpedoed. It sank within 18 minutes. There were celebrities on board. There were people like Lady Allen, for example. Um, uh, she managed, she and her maid managed to scramble into a lifeboat, um, clutching her diamond and pearl tiara. But her two little daughters were elsewhere in the ship and they perished. Um, the ship went down so quickly, it was almost impossible to know how to get out of it. And if you were below decks, you know, you were looking at a watery and rapid end, I'm afraid. So yes, the Lusitania was a shocking, um, a shocking incident. Funny of my Irish relatives from Kinsale were amongst some of the first on the scene. I had some Irish fishing relatives um, and they were out fishing and they saw it uh, and they they got to the scene and rescued people. But there were so many people. I think they lost something like 1500 people. It was an enormous amount of people. Um, mm -hmm. Just drowned. Dreadful. Um, uh, so much detail. Josephine Baker. Uh, the oh, I love Josephine and Baker. The, a cruise ship brought her to a new life in her adopted city of Paris. That's right, yeah. She, she traveled on, I think it was the Majestic. I, I can't remember exactly. Uh, it was a British ship um, and she had been offered a chance to star in a review. She was completely self-trained dancer as far as I'm aware. And she came originally from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, she grew up in very, very humble circumstances. And of course she was, you know, uh, black American. Um, she was much discriminated against growing up and she got to New York. She, she danced literally for nickels and dimes outside theatres and proved to be such an amazing performer that she was picked up and put on stage. She got the chance to appear in a review in, uh, I think it was 1925 in Paris. Um, and along with a whole load of other uh, performers and musicians, she traveled in third class um, to get to Paris. And she found, she found France amazing because she was so good at what she did that her, her rather humble origins just made her seem more exotic, more adorable, more um, approachable, more, more remarkable. Um, and she found, she found a, a country in which she could live and be happy. Um, she had some nasty experiences coming back on ships, actually interesting, going back to America to appear in Ziegfeld Follies, where she was discriminated against, but she loved France and she, she, she prospered. She prospered. She was brave enough, like a lot of these women, to just get on a boat and give it a go. Oh, I do apologise. That's our phone. <laughs> okay. Um, she's busy. Um, <laughs> I'm busy. We actually, we actually tell Dad. Get the phone. Um, we actually only have a, a, a couple more minutes. I just fly uh, because there's so much information. Mm. I just, in, in kind of a, a summation, you know, so the stewardesses and the conductresses on board the. 
uh, swim coaches, the, the at least one engineer, you write about Victoria Drummond, yes. uh, who was a ship's engineer. And there's a description of her piloting a ship while it's under attack, hot steaming scalding water on her and a, and a male uh, sailor mm. watching this incredible thing where she's literally holding the ship together, holding oh. holes, you know, bullets are coming past her. Um, it, it is, it does feel true um, and, oh. and not just clever, you know, that, that these cruise ships changed the lives of women. They did. They gave women agency. They gave women. I mean, uh, there are lots of tales of bravery in these books, and they, this is this this is bravery on the part of women who we've never heard of. I mean, we all heard about celebrities and you know and how great they are and all this sort of thing. There's plenty been written about that. What I like about this book and what I liked about the subject matter of this book is that there are many many tales of ordinary women leading extraordinary lives, and these were the women whose examples. Um, allowed women to go and work full time on board ships, allowed them to train as engineers, allowed women to become pilots, because if you could work, you know, you could work on board a ship, you could, you could work on a plane, you could, it, it, there were ways in which women achieved agency and independence in an era when it was very difficult to do that. And they were also able to travel the world. So many, as we were saying last night, Robin, so many women actually managed to get around the world because they were working on the ships. It was remarkable. And again, it was the only way to travel. If there were no other ways to travel apart from on ship, and therefore you might as well throw yourself into it. And as they say, you know, a definition of being brave is, is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. These are brave women. These were our, our, our forebears and they, they did brilliantly mess them. That doesn't mean to say they didn't occasionally collapse in floods of tears or have a stiff gin in their cabin or, you know, cry on the shoulder of their, their, their best friend or whatever. Nobody's perfect, but my God, they were brave. Yeah, not just the women working on the ship, but women will, willing to go way, way down <laughs> into yes. the bottom of the ship to find yes, yeah. a, a, a new world. Well, I, I mean, it's just, it's an extraordinary read and, uh, you know, I thank you for it. Is there any one story we have now, I'm looking, maybe just a couple minutes, uh, Margaret's yeah. going to back and close this out. Is there any one story, uh, one character? Um, I love Hemingway's estranged wife. <laughs> Martha Gellhorn, she was great, wasn't she? Yeah, but she any really any wonderful. anything you want to leave us with, the, the stowaways, the, you know, just... Um, I think this, that's a remarkable story. In the 1920s, there are a lot of people of German origin who were just desperate. Post-World War I, Germany was, was a, a basket case financially. And there was a woman who had been a former stewardess, and she'd been a German, and she'd been laid off the Hamburg America line because they just couldn't afford to keep her on. And she was so desperate to, to feed her family. Her, she had a, an ill mother and a, and a brother. She was so desperate that she wrote to her cousin in California and he said look I can't send you any money but if you can get to New York I can send you enough money to get from New York to California and she stowed away on board a ship and the way in which she did this was um, down in the hold um, there was a uh, ballast to stop the ship rocking too much and quite often it was gravel kind of stuff you lay on a road you know little chippings like that but tons and tons of gravel and of course it was dark because it was a hold she managed to sneak onto a ship and lie in the hold covered in gravel. She took with her a bottle of water and some ham. And after five days afloat, hidden in the gravel, she thought we must be more than halfway now. And she banged on the hatch. And on the locked hatch. <laughs> on the locked hatch, locked from the outside. And thank God somebody heard her above the sound of the engines. And they retrieved her and she was absolutely filthy. And because she was more than halfway there, they took her to New York mm -hmm. and, you know, her story is reported in the New York Times. And you think, how brave do you have to be to lie in gravel? How desperate are you to, to, to escape your own origins, you know, to, to get away to make a new life that you would put up with that? I think that's just remarkable. Well, so writing, she's one of our characters. Yeah. Your writing also makes us think of modern day immigrants yes. trying to get yeah, to a better does. world. Um, and also just uh, and one other aspect that is was just very powerful um, in the Second World War um, or in the lead up to it in particular, cruise ships played a great role in helping uh, Jews escape 
uh, yeah. in other countries, including Al Albert Einstein. And you describe, you know, as, as the stewards and stewardesses, uh, you know, have made these notes, huge sympathy towards mm -hmm. the people who were, uh, the drum beats were there and how cruise ships had these secret meetings, uh, enabled secret meetings between Winston Churchill on one cruise ship that went out yes. in the middle of the night to meet with Roosevelt, you know, it just, um, their role is, is really quite something. So I thank you, Sean Evans, hold up the book again. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I smell movie. I smell movie on many different ways. <laughs> I think it's movie what material, don't you? I do. I'd love to watch a movie about that. I really would. There would be so many different themes though to that movie. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't know what the movie could be. It would be, I mean, I really, what a fabulous conversation you two. I have so many images in my head, which makes oh. me, you are absolutely right. Movie is the right way to go with this. Um, <laughs> at glamour, history, um, immigration, uh, really remarkable. And, so, and for those, Margaret, just for those saying they made it, Titanic, oh no, no, no. That's just the chapter. <laughs> no, scratch the surface. That's that's yeah. barely it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, and I, but anything. I think any of us in the audience right now, anything cruise ship. Somebody said, be sure to watch *Brideheads Revisited* uh, yes. because a, a lot of the scenery is um, in that. Uh, that's right. So we're all really eager to travel. Um, and Robin, I am so glad you were our travel guide uh, into this fascinating Thank topic. You. Thank you so much. Uh, really grateful. Um, heading now toward the end of our time together, I want to shift to our closing reading from the book. Uh, Sean, will you share some last words, uh, your sure. own words from Maiden Voyage before we wrap up? I'd be very happy to. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Courtney. You've done a brilliant job and I've enjoyed it so much. And thank you. Thank you for watching. Here we go. I'm starting, I'm finishing with the beginning of the book. This is the prologue. Smart and snug in heather-toned tweeds, a British-born lady passenger of middle years and independent means is settled in a teak steamer chair on the promenade deck, deck sorry, of an ocean liner heading west across the Atlantic. There is a whiff of healthy ozone from the sea and fellow travellers taking the air variously saunter or speed pass, competing for laps heading to the gym or to the swimming pool. The attentive deck steward proffers a steaming mug of bouillon, so effective against seasickness. But um, just in order to be sure, she'll take another Mother Sills tablet. Just as that kind stewardess had predicted, the heaving swell of the Atlantic Ocean, once they passed Ireland, had proved to be a little too lively for comfort. Yesterday had crawled by in a disorientating, low-lit blur. She had spent several hours wedged into her bunk, lying prone, wishing for death. While keeping an eye on the discreetly positioned vase de nuit, uh, just in case. But this morning she had woken up with the appetite of a bootle-born skull stoker. She had rung the bell twice for the stewardess. A single ring would summon the steward, which would breach etiquette, and requested a fully laden breakfast tray of kippers, tea and toast. Her equilibrium has now been restored in every sense. Standing with her feet at the 10 to 2 ballet position for maximum stability, her knees slightly bent, as the stewardess tactfully suggested, also seems to help. Bathed, dressed and ready to face the world, our heroine has ventured out onto the covered deck and secured a reclining chair. Her thoughts turn to her fellow passengers. She must trawl through the alphabetically arranged list of first class passengers' names left prominently in her cabin to see if there's anyone she knows on board or can spot anyone she might like to meet. Society is superior to variety and she's hoping to make the acquaintance of the elite also traveling in first class. In particular, she is looking out for a pleasant, well-heeled bachelor as there is rather a dearth of those at home just a few years after the end of the Great War. Perhaps she'll do better in America, land of opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What a marvelous picture of international travel, of hopes and dreams and new beginnings. Um, you've given us great insight, Sean, into the lives of women of a time and a spirit. This is really the sort of the best form of summer diversion, particularly on a rainy day. So um, thank you. And just a reminder for all of you out there, if you enjoyed this this afternoon, uh, signed copies of Maiden Voyages can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. Again, use the code MINS20 as you order online and they'll waive the shipping fee for media mail.
We at American Ancestors are very delighted to have co-presented uh, this event with WBUR City Space. Um, if you are researching your family or a time or a place in history, you'll find our library at NEHGS and our education center to be useful. Our stacks on Newbury Street are now open, or you can visit our digital archives anytime. You can also connect with our genealogist nine to five each weekday or join in an educational program from our Brew Family Learning Center. All of this online through AmericanAncestors.org. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and to connect people. Uh, we are, as I said, delighted to be in partnership with WBUR City Space. Our counterparts there have asked me to pass on news that City Space's fall season is beginning on September 9. Join WBUR in person or virtually for cutting edge conversations, adventurous art, and innovative ideas. Upcoming guests include Jacques Pepin, Angie Thomas, and Nina Totenberg. They encourage you to scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or to sign up for WBR events newsletter there, or and you can be the first to access tickets to the new season when they go on sale. Um, Back in the virtual realm, we at, at American Ancestors NEHGS have a variety of great events coming up. On Tuesday, August 17th, we're welcoming Scott Borchard with his book, Republic of Dreams, How the New Deal Paid Broke Writers to Rediscover America. Um, he is going to be in dialogue with our own NEHGS senior genealogist, Rhonda McClure. And then on August 26, perfect for summertime, we've got John N. McLean with Home Waters, uh, which is his uh, recollection of the Blackfoot River in Montana. Um, he is, of course, uh, the son of the great writer Norman McLean, uh, who did that fabulous book, a, a movie, A River Runs Through It, with Robert Redford. Uh, so that's going to be a great evening. And then looking ahead to the 2nd of September, we're welcoming the famous historians, uh, uh, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar. Uh, 40 years ago, they wrote, wrote the book, uh, The Mad Woman in the Attic, and they are back with a book called Still Mad, American Women Writers and Feminist Imagination. Uh, these women are the gold standard when it comes to literary criticism and women's history, and you will want to hear from them about uh, the second wave feminist movement. So do join us for an event in the future. We're looking forward to that. And meanwhile, back to tonight to uh, this afternoon, rather, to women of this past century gone. We are so grateful to you, Robin, and also to you, Sean. Thank you for giving us such food for thought and taking us on this journey back through history. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And so from Cardiff and also from Brookline and Cambridge and Providence, Rhode Island. We wish all of you in the audience, thank you for your questions. Thank you for being with us. We wish you a great and inspirational evening and summer days ahead. Take care.